This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Should there be politics from the pulpit? Well, today my guest will share his viewpoint on how the church has an obligation to stand up for its community moral standards. Also, a former Michigan State Senator will share how his perspective has changed once his father, engineer, and Christian was thrown into the political swamp. He wrote about his experiences in this book. We will meet Patrick Colbeck. But first, what scripture makes your head spin? I asked this question to Steve Light. Steve's a husband, father, and an executive at a Fortune 500 business. And like most Christians, has had some struggles with some scriptures. There's always something in there, people that I've talked to, that it's tough to get either their faith around yeah. or their mind around. Either it's a cultural thing and I can't get my mind around this, or it's a faith thing, I just can't believe God's calling me to this. Yeah. Oh, what, what was it for you? Is anything come off the top of your head and say, this is a tough script? And there's a lot. Open of it and pick to one. They're all like <laughs> yeah, that for me. It, it, you know, it's, what challenges you most? Yeah, you know, one that recently has haunted me in a great way has been Second Peter 1, 5 through 7. So let's, let's go through it yeah. first and then we'll yeah. come back to it. So it says, supplant your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with perseverance, perseverance with godliness, godliness with brotherly love and brotherly love with love. And so when it I, builds, well, I mean, if you look at those. It does, yeah. You see, you're wise. You've been studying no. for a while. You get that instantly. <laughs> no. I didn't get it. But, but at the same time, it's, it's a commandment. It's, yes. just, it's telling you to do this. That's right. How do you do it? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I first had to get to the point back to your, your question of, was this a series of activities? Mm -hmm. And at first I thought it was just pieces and parts, kind of like in Galatians and the fruits of the Spirit. Yeah. These are a series mm -hmm. of things. But as I wrestled with it, I began to understand that we were, we're called to be disciples. As a matter of fact, as you know, in the New Testament, um, Paul uses the word mimitas. And what mimitas mm -hmm. in Greek means is imitator. It's where we get imitator. imitation from. Mm -hmm. And so we're called to imitate who? Jesus Christ. And so then when I started understanding that from my seminary studies, I began to realize it was a progression. It was our map, if you will, of how to be more Christ-like. And so as I started stepping through that, I began to realize, okay, wait, this is more practical than I thought. I've said Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, which means I now need to start living good, doing the right things. Right. But how do I live right? I need to know scripture. I had to improve my knowledge. But once I improved my knowledge, back to your point, God commands us to live a certain way, mm -hmm. that takes self-control, right? right? And then as I do self-control, I can't do it one time, I have to do it all the time, I have to persevere. It becomes a discipline. It becomes a discipline. And now as I start to live a more righteous life that God's called me to, I begin to act more godly, and then- Imitate Christ. Imitate Christ. But so far, everything's been inward. Mm -hmm. It's about transforming right. me. But what do we know about Jesus Christ? Self-sacrificing love. He says, no love is greater than this, than a man who would lay down his life for his friends. Now you begin to do brotherly love. Now, I love you, Bob, yeah. and I know you, so it's easy to do the right sure. thing by you. But how about somebody in the world that I get frustrated by? Somebody I don't have the same belief that with. That difficult person. Very difficult. Yeah. What's that last stage? Yeah. It is the love that God showed us by sending Christ to the cross, and it's that unconditional love. It's what they call in the scripture, mm -hmm. said. It's that unconditional love. And that's what we're striving for. And as I began to realize that, I went, okay, this is the path that I want to walk as a Christian. Some days I'm in self-control, some days I'm still in knowledge, and some days I'll hit, I'll hit perseverance. He's called you to add to those things. He's called to add to And as, as he showed you that scripture, yeah. did he challenge you with an irregular person in your life, that person that, you know, we all have an irregular person yeah. someplace. They may be related to us, yeah. but they're just great on us, or they're just, I don't want to be around them so much. And yeah. Because there, you got to show brotherly love. Yeah. You've got to start imitating Christ. Did he challenge you with anybody like that? Oh, in your he, life? he did. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it's funny how you know God opens doors. Um, uh, pastor, my church, I belong to one church in mm -hmm. Gehanna. And uh, pastor came to me and said, We have done an amazing job going from 40 people to 4,000 in seven years. Wow. That and is we, huge. Huge. God has just been bountiful you, in bringing new yeah. people to us. But the challenge, he said, is we need to create disciples. And we didn't have a formal program yeah. for developing disciples. And so God taught me the scripture. We've created a 12 week course where we teach the disciplines that were taught in the early church that have disappeared. We teach fasting and holy reading, uh, prayer, um, stewardship, spiritual mm -hmm. gifts. A lot of things churches don't touch anymore. And invariably, 
Uh, we've run two classes of nearly 20 people, and God has brought in there a whole mix of people <laughs> with a whole lot of opinions. And it's been, it's really tested me to make sure that I'm showing the grace and the love and the respect as people bring their opinions about yeah. what this what this means. Especially in a group. I, I, in a group. I applaud you for that, because in a group, you, you get one irregular person that keeps going down rabbit trails or challenging on this or yes. not wanting to get his head around something. Everybody else yes. is ready to move on. Yes. And it, it's got to be frustrating for a leader. Well, I'll give you two examples of that, um, or two points of that. The first is, is that I don't engage that ever without the Holy Spirit. Good so point. it's not the work yep. I do, it's the work mm -hmm. that the Spirit does in yep. me. And when I have that mindset, there's a gentleness, one of the fruits of the Spirit from Galatians mm -hmm. that comes through. Um, because I, I try to approach it very humbly. It's not about me being right, it's about yeah. God revealing what He wants to people. Second thing I would say is that, imagine a class where you've got somebody who's grown up in a Baptist tradition mm -hmm. and somebody who's grown up in a Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. Very different perspective so, about the spiritual world, right? Job there. And so it's a lot of fun to bring them in and demonstrate to them how if we get back to the Bible and we get to what mm -hmm. Scripture says and we really read what it says, we find we have more in common theologically than what we believe. And the, the key to all of this that we've taught them is uh, Romans 14, the law of liberty. Mm -hmm. And if we really spent time there, I think it would help us engage the world differently. Because remember, and I'll summarize it quickly, Paul basically said, look, you can fight over a Saturday yep. or Sunday holy, whether fasting this or not is, is right, but it's really about where your heart is. Mm -hmm. If your heart is right and is pointed towards God, when you do things, whether it's fasting, prayer, service, spiritual gifts, you're doing it for the right reasons, God will bless you for it. And we shouldn't be critical of each other when we're trying to move in the same direction. Well, you're, you're creating disciples. Yeah. They're individuals. They've got their own personality. They've got their own background. They're coming right. from their own culture. You're not creating robots. Oh, perfect. I mean, a lot of people would say that, hey, every Christian's got to march in the step. But no. Not at all. God's going to use your word. Not at all. Well, uh, you know, it's funny. I was studying scripture on the drive over. I was listening to the Bible. And I was reminded in Galatians when Paul was saying, hey, I got together with Peter. Yeah. And Peter was focusing on how to approach the Jews. And I was focusing on the Gentiles. Totally different ministries, mm -hmm. but same purpose. And that's exactly what yeah. you're talking about. You know, I, I always try to remind myself and the disciples that we get a chance to teach is that you don't do the spiritual formation and the disciplines that Second Peter teaches you because you have to. That's being yeah. a robot. Mm -hmm. God gave us free will and he loves us and he's trying to offer us a life that's more abundant and more satisfying. Right. We do it because we want to out of worshiping him in love, not because we have to. Good, good definition of servant leadership. You're, you're leading them, you're not driving them. That's exactly right, yeah. that's exactly mm -hmm. right, yeah. Our culture is moving away from a biblically-based lifestyle faster than ever in history. Even many believers struggle to explain their own viewpoint on who Jesus really is. God says in the Old Testament that my people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge. That's why TV44 created Viewpoint with Bob Lacey, a program that discusses biblical issues and how they relate to our culture today. Now in our second season, Viewpoint is hitting more topics head on than ever this year. Every Viewpoint program is produced without any commercial advertising, so no topics are off limits. But we couldn't do this show without the support of our financial partners. Maybe you've never supported a Christian media ministry before, but in today's world, our message is needed more than ever, and it only takes a minute to give. Go to WTLW.com and click Get Involved, then Donate. Your gift of 20, 50, or even $100 will help continue the outreach of TV44's Viewpoint program to impact your hometown and the world. What happens when fed up citizens turn an engineer loose on the political swamp? Well, we're going to find out today because the author of the book, Wrestling Gators, Patrick Kolbeck, is with us, and he was a senator in the state of Michigan, the first one elected without any political experience at all. That is amazing. <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> well, uh, actually, you don't do that. You, you put yourself on your knees and you let God uh, open the doors. Does God call you to something like that? Because you had no experience in city government, uh, hadn't been a, in the House of Representatives. You went right to the Senate. Uh, yeah. you, did you feel called to that at the time or pushed a into it in some way? Absolutely. I mean, there's, let me put it this way. Engineers aren't known for their uh, being extroverts. Yeah. <laughs> so the whole idea that I'd be going off and knocking on 6,000 doors, I mean, there was a purpose to it. There was a calling to it. Mm -hmm. And we had, uh, we felt at peace going off and doing this um, for quite a few years before then. My wife and I had been kind of waking up to our faith and the fact that we should be doing more than just 
cranking numbers and spreadsheets. <laughs> um, and uh, and this is one of those areas where we started getting more politically active back in the 20, uh, 2009 time mm-hmm. frame, back when the Tea Party got started up. Yeah. And we actually went to our first uh, political event ever. It was actually the Tea Party rally on April 15, 2009. Met a whole bunch of folks there, started getting plugged into different events, started going to office hours, and, um, you know, next thing you knew, um, we were actually uh, being called to actually go off and run after attending an office hour for a gentleman that was going to be running for the position I eventually ran for, uh-huh. and uh, the guy lied to us. We had done our homework beforehand, and I go, man, anybody that can lie this easily, I don't want them representing me mm-hmm. up in Lansing, and so we went off, prayed about it. They've got a deadline because <laughs> we want to be very specific. And uh, deadline was February 21st. And that morning, our, our, my devotion read uh, from 1 Corinthians 9, 24, for many run in the race, but only one gets a prize. Uh, a run in such guy. ways to get the prize. Yep. And that's exactly what we did. And that's what kept me out there knocking doors from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. every single day. Did you, for some. did you go into this with your eyes wide open or is it better off to be a little bit uninformed about what, what really happens in politics? Well, actually, my background's in management consulting, so I mean, I'm used to dealing with people and uh, understanding that I'm I'm not the one who can always make the final decision about how we proceed on things. But uh, you have to influence people to go off and see things your way, and you're always dealing with different characters in that kind of environment. So uh, politics, frankly, it wasn't a heck of a lot different from management consulting. And frankly, my first exposure to politics was on church council, anyway. So I was I was well equipped from that. But normally when you're doing a uh, negotiation in a business sense, you've got two sides to the negotiation. You're going yeah. into a two-party system, but you're not extremely popular with either side of that. Yeah, it's kind of one-party system. It's kind of a state party, if you will. Um, there's, sometimes there's not a heck of a lot of difference between how Republicans and Democrats act. Now, I think there's significant difference in their platforms and what they say that they believe in. But from what I've observed in actions, um, sometimes there's not a heck of a lot of difference, unfortunately. It, but you're going into a, into a Senate and into a, a, that really both sides of this were not in favor of what you were doing. How do you keep from getting uh, sucked up into that and becoming something that you didn't run on? I mean, somebody asked you actually after you got elected that now that you've been elected, how are you going to keep from becoming part of the problem rather than part of the yeah. solution? How did you yeah, do well, that? We put, yeah, well, we put down a little... Uh, a set of guidelines for me on every um, bill that came before me. I put together something I called the compass. It was my Mm -hmm. voter compass. And so I would always stay calibrated on what I told the voters I would do. I wrote these principles down. I had some simple uh, um, questions I would ask myself before every bill came up before us or before I pursued any given policy. Like, is it constitutional? Will it make it, um, uh, is it applied equally to everybody in the state? Which is something that is probably one of the more Uh, commonly abridged uh, um, elements of our Michigan Constitution Mm -hmm. with the laws that are passed because uh, they always seem to favor one group or another. And so, and one of the, my favorites, I guess, is easy enough for an eighth grader to understand. That's a good one. uh, Yeah, Yeah. because there's a lot of, a lot of laws that get passed that are deliberately setting it up so that you can't interpret whether or not you're following the law or not. And Stalin had a nice little expression uh, back when he was in power in the Soviet Union. He said, you show me the man, I'll show you the crime. Well, when you make the law so complex and Mm -hmm. so voluminous that you can't figure out whether or not you're even following the law, you know you're in trouble. Right. Well, one of the chapters I haven't gotten to yet in the book is what happens, and this is is a tough one. What happens when one upsets the swamp? Because you're looking at draining the swamp, and the swamp's been there for a long time. What happens, and what kind of repercussions do you get when you're upsetting the apple cart and you're not well, a popular person? It is not pleasant. I mean, just a little bit of background first. When I, during my first term in office, I was elected to the Senate leadership team. Uh, I was our assistant caucus uh, chair, mm-hmm. and um, I served as the chair of the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs and, Mil- and Michigan State Police Budgets. Um, and during that time frame, we turned, we converted all those budgets into performance-based budgets that we were like one of the last states when it came to veteran services. By the time I was done with my four, or four years there, we were number two in veteran services. And we had uh, eliminated uh, three out of the top, out of our four um, cities that were on the top 10 crime list in the, in the, uh, in the whole country. Um, so we had serious improvements. Now, you'd think coming out of that, when you start yeah. your second term, they'd be looking for you to go off and 
take on additional responsibility. Yeah, but certainly. That's not what happened because, see, during that first term, and mind you, uh, we have a Republican majority. It's a super majority in the Michigan Senate. We, in the first term, we had 26 Republican senators out of 38 senators. That's called a super majority. In the second term, we had another super majority of 27 senators. And, um, and I, uh, it, it is a, you'd think that we had Republican Senate, we had a Republican House, we had a Republican governor. Yet during that first term, we passed Medicaid expansion. We passed taxes on, on senior pensions. Uh, we passed increased taxes for uh, gas taxes for roads. And uh, I was pretty vocal in opposition mm -hmm. to those policies. And I was also vocal in opposition to something called Common Core on education. Um, and I, I thought that was a top-down control of our education system. And I thought there was a lot of danger associated with that. Um, by the way, all the positions that uh, I had, I was on the side of the Republican platform yeah, and Republican Party. Sounds I opposed, like the Republican platform. Yeah, I oppose. I I, I, uh, I oppose the expansion of Obamacare, known as Medicaid expansion. I oppose Common Core, all, and I oppose all these tax increases unless there there's nothing else possible to go off and keep the government afloat, and that wasn't the case. And so when I came back from my second term, I found out via the press, by the way, not via the new incoming Senate Majority Leader, who I actually did vote for, found out via the press that I was the only returning senator, including a bunch of freshmen that were starting for the first time, that did not get any chairmanships. And I thought that was kind of strange. Yeah, doesn't sound right. Yeah, so I texted the Senate Majority Leader, and I said, well, what do you mean? I, I, what, is this true? I didn't get any uh, chairmanships? And he goes, yeah, you didn't earn it. Uh. I go, really? I mean, I just talked to you about some of the accomplishments we had mm -hmm. as chair. I mean, I can go into I mean, right to work itself sure. was a bit of an accomplishment. Um, and leading that effort took a lot of effort. But uh, he said I didn't earn it. And I go, well, you know, we're going to have to have a little bit of a meeting. And I got to dig into this. And, you know, I sat down with him and tried to understand exactly what he meant by you didn't earn this. And he said, number one, you were too vocal in your opposition to Medicaid expansion. Um, by the way, I was on the Republican side of that. <laughs> Number two, I was too vocal in my opposition to Common Core. Um, number three said I underperformed in my district. And I just for background, I was one of two state level um, legislators that was targeted by the National Democratic Party. <laughs> so they obviously saw a threat with me um, in that position. And the fourth um, example he said was that I need to talk at more of an eighth grade level to my colleagues. So uh. those were the reasons that he gave for not a not granting me a wow. chairmanship. And I, I go, you know, this is a case where I, I was not mean to anybody. I did not target anybody, put pejoratives towards any of my colleagues. But I hit the policies with both barrels. Mm -hmm. And this is about um, freedom of speech. It's about representing the people that put you into office. And um, later on, I had a little discussion with the Senate Majority Leader. And he um, he made it clear. I mean, that's where the personalities come in. And when we talk about wrestling gators, yeah. he's a prime example of one of those gators that bites inside the swamp. But uh, later on in the session, he actually uh, challenged me to a gun duel and oh. pulled out his gun in the middle of caucus. And, and just to show you the dynamics and the power that's wielded by a Senate majority leader, not one person stood up and said that that's something that should not be done. So Wow. That, this a, is, a real, a real get, gun? A, oh, Yeah. <laughs> It's a, he brandished his firearm and then challenged me to a duel um, wow. in front of 25 of my colleagues. And, and so this is a case where and I'm, I'm not a, I, I don't throw bombs at people. I mean, yeah. this is just about being persistent. We had a disagreement on policy. Ironically, it was gun control policy. Yeah. I was on the side of the Second Amendment just for references. And, um, and, and so, but this is how disagreements are, are treated yeah, in today's amazing. society. We're not able to have a logical debate it's like uh, my way or the highway and i just oh. I've, I've never been uh, born and bred to roll that way if, if you were to flip the tables on that and you would have pulled a gun on him you'd you'd probably still be fighting the legal suit oh no it'd, it'd be horrible i'd probably be eating uh, bread and water yeah. <laughs> behind some bars right now but patrick thank you for the book it's it's uh an outsider's guide and you were an outsider to draining the swamp wrestling gators patrick colbeck where can they get the book uh, you can go up on Amazon. It's probably the best way of getting it. And if you want to check into some of the policies that are outlined in there, probably the best way to um, get plugged in is just go to morninginmichigan.com. It also contains a link specifically to the page in Amazon where you can get that. I really want people to understand how government works on the inside with this book so that they can be more effective in their advocacy.
Viewpoint with Bob Lacey is now available as a podcast. Download your favorite podcast app like iTunes, Google Play, or Spotify and search for Viewpoint with Bob Lacey. Subscribe and listen as we discuss these important topics each week. Now in our second season, Viewpoint is hitting more topics head on than ever this year. Every Viewpoint program is produced without any commercial advertising, but we couldn't do this show without the support of our financial partners, and it only takes a minute to give. Go to WTLW.com and click Get Involved, then Donate. Your gift of $20, $50, or even $100 will help continue the outreach of TV44's Viewpoint program to impact your hometown and the world. Should the church stand up and get involved in politics on a local level? Well, I sat down with Aaron Baer, who's a part of a group called Citizens for Community Values. Their organization has fought on issues such as community standards for obscenity, as well as the heartbeat bill here in Ohio. Aaron says getting the church involved in the political conversation is a priority at this time in our country. Back with me is Aaron Baer, president of uh, Citizens for Community Values. And you do a, a thing with, with churches called Difficult Dialogues. And we've been talking uh, in uh, previous shows about the church coming alive and standing up to some of these issues we see today. And why is that dialogue so difficult in the church? <laughs> <laughs> well, is it, it difficult topics or difficult yeah. people to wake up? Well, I, I, maybe a little bit of both. I, I think, you know, really what we see, especially when we're talking about LGBT issues today uh, and the transgender issue in particular, mm -hmm. is that for, for your average person in America today, uh, the only place they're going to hear a sort of a countercultural narrative on these that, that is based in truth, that's based in science, uh, that's based in love is the church. You know, for, for a, a child today in public schools, you know, they're not going to hear, all they're going to hear is a celebration of these things in the public mm -hmm. schools, in the media, in movies. Um, and so what we want to do is come alongside churches and help them engage in this conversation in a loving and grace-filled way, but also in a way that's based in truth, that's based in medical science and, and not be afraid of these issues. Truth and love. Amen. I mean, truth without love is brutality. That's and right. And love without truth is just a lie. Exactly. And, exactly. and we're, we're looking at these, uh, you, you look at the situation right now with, with pushing the agenda of the left. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the church is the target. Yeah. Uh, why, why is that? You know, I, I think, well, first and foremost, and, and this is something we talk a lot about, our, our mission at Citizens for Community Values is, our mission field is the public policy space. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Just like a, you know, a homeless shelter is to, to serve the homeless or the addicted or, or you know, battered women. Uh, but we also need to recognize with everything we do, there's a strong spiritual component. Uh, right. and, and so we very much see a lot of the targeting coming at the church uh, is predictable and there's a spiritual aspect to it. And so we don't want to be blind uh, to the realities of, of what we're facing. Is there a fear of crossing the line though? I mean, I, if, if I'm a pastor in the pulpit or I'm leading a Bible study or I'm out on a, a stump in a, in a public park, is there, is there a fear of crossing the line and being labeled? You're a hater. You, right. you hate women. You hate gays. It's just, is there, is there a fear of being labeled that? Well, I, I think you do see that fear in a lot of churches where they, they want to try to keep, uh, keep doors and avenues open to share the gospel at all times. Um, what we see, though, especially you look at the churches that are growing, they're the churches that aren't, uh, that aren't shying away from the truth. Now, they, they want to be grace-filled in how they present mm -hmm. it. They want to be loving. They want, they want their LGBT neighbor coming into their church to experience the grace and love of Jesus Christ. Uh, but they're not hiding away. They're not ashamed of the gospel. They're not ashamed of the cross. Um, and really what you see more and more is you see a lot of these. You, you're hard-pressed to find a liberal megachurch today. Uh, or a liberal church that's thriving because at the end of the day these leftist liberal churches they're life coaches and people will eventually look at them and be like why do I need to come to this church in the first place everything they're saying I can figure out on my own let me be a good person let me not you know steal from people I, I kind of got that figured out uh, that's all I need. Yeah. I always kind of laugh at the dichotomy of, of the left yelling that the, uh, the right is science deniers when it comes to the global warming or global change, yeah. <laughs> and yet we look at we look at a baby in the womb, or we look at somebody who says, "I'm I'm non-binary. I'm not a man or a woman." And the denial of science, the Bible and science are—I mean, science is there because the Bible. Exactly. No, that, that's exactly. Science just reveals more of God's mm -hmm. beautiful and magnificent creation. That's what we see time and time again. And that—that that really is, you know, when, when we talk about the, the the transgender issue in particular, um, we, we we say, and, and and not to be too graphic, we say it doesn't matter what you cut off or remove or put on. 
biologically, genetically, you cannot change your sex. You know, your, your, your sex is hard-coded into your DNA. It, it, talk, we, it gets into your bone yeah. structure and your muscle density and, and all of these things. I mean, it, it, it is much more than, than, you know, what makeup you wear or what clothes you put on or what surgery you get. Uh, it, it's so much more than that. And that's just basic science there. That, that's not even, a, we're not even talking theology at this point. <laughs> Yeah, and, but it's denied in, That's in a right. lot of cases. They That's say, well, you right. can't say that. You can't tell me that. And I don't know how many genders there are now, technically, but <laughs> I've always counted two. That's right. That's what the Bible's always shown us. No, no, yeah. that's, and that's what creation has revealed. I mean, even too, when you just look at um, what the, the function of gender, the function of sex uh, is reproduction. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, that's a binary act. That's a binary uh, creation to make. So what, would you, what do you challenge the churches to do? You know, really what we want to challenge churches on is first and foremost, make sure you're in an environment where an LGBT person could come in and pursue the grace and love of mm -hmm. God and then be challenged just like you and I need challenged every sure. day to grow and be sanctified on the blood of Christ. Uh, but then, but also equip the saints. You know, we really see with, uh, with children today especially, but even parents, they're getting bombarded every day by t being celebrated. You know, the culture is calling good evil and evil good. Mm -hmm. And things, people in your church that you might think are solid and would, would never accept this, they have real questions. And the question is for, that we're bringing to churches mm -hmm. with this difficult dialogues conversation is are you creating an environment uh, where people in your church can sincerely ask these questions and get real answers? Yeah. And you mentioned the schools a couple of times and what kids are he hearing in the schools. Is that a is that indoctrination? Is that overt? Is that just is that just grown? Yeah, no, we, we, we genuinely do see it as overt in many ways. Where uh, you know they're they're outright talking about how they uh, the, the their sort of LGBT sensitivity trainings or or their what they're doing with sexual what they would call comprehensive sexual sexual education today. Uh, it's very clear, and it's one of the reasons why for CCV, we're big advocates for school choice, for private Christian schools, for homeschooling. We're not anti-public school. I went to public school. Mm -hmm. Um, but as of right now, there needs to be accountability in public schools and parents need to be able to say, hey, you're not doing well for my child, so I'm going to take them elsewhere. How do you do that in the public sector? I mean, if you, if you can't afford a private school, you, you want to stay in the public schools or a charter school, how do you do that in the public sector as a, as a, as a citizen? Yeah, so, well, I, I would say first and foremost, getting involved in the school choice movement, fighting for vouchers, fighting for tax credits, those types of things, mm -hmm. so that a parent can take, uh, can send their kid to any school that best meets their needs, regardless of their income or zip code, is a huge part of it. But the other side of it still is, too, it's, it's good old-fashioned grassroots organizing. Run for school mm -hmm. board. Get on the places that hold people accountable. Get involved in the PTA, uh, because so many of these decisions are made through relationship, and if we're not involved in the conversation, our voice isn't heard. Now in our second season, Viewpoint is hitting more topics head-on than ever this year. Every Viewpoint program is produced without any commercial advertising, but we couldn't do this show without the support of our financial partners, and it only takes a minute to give. Go to WTLW.com and click Get Involved, then Donate. Your gift of $20, $50, or even $100 will help continue the outreach of TV44's Viewpoint program to impact your hometown and the world. I appreciate you joining me today. Please share our interviews on YouTube. Also, you can find Viewpoint interviews on iTunes and anywhere you listen to a podcast. I'm Bob Placey. Thanks for joining me today. Remember, you can share all the Viewpoint interviews you've seen today online at YouTube. And you can listen to the Viewpoint podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and anywhere you can listen to a podcast.